everyone, welcome to my session, Multilingual in Drupal 8, featuring visittheusa.com. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've got the slides. Uh, you can do a bit.ly link, uh, 2LV1, capital V, lowercase i, capital L, if you want to see the slides a little bit better. I recommend that. You're going to want to see the little screenshots and things I do. So my name is Jay. I've worked for Media Current for the last eight years. My title is currently Director of Development. You can follow me at Triple Ninja on Twitter. What is Media Current? Media Current helps organizations build highly impactful, elegantly designed Drupal websites that achieve the strategic results they need. All right, so let's talk through today's outline. I kept it pretty close to the original session outline. Um, I did add uh, configuring languages because I left that out. That'll be important. I'm going to show you a lot of screen grabs and annotated screen grabs, things like that, um, in the interest of time. I've, I've got the site pulled up locally. If we, if we do later on, you know, uh, want to pull up the site and look at stuff more in depth, um, we can. But uh, I think the screenshots and things will be helpful. And like I mentioned, most of most of this is coming from uh, an actual recent build, Visit USA. It's a very big, um, it's a very big travel site, and it's like the official travel site for the USA. So it's international audience, tons of languages. Um, so many of you, I think, are like me. Maybe you've done multilingual in Drupal, but either you. Um, you don't do it all the time, or you just haven't done it yet in Drupal 8. And so, for me, when I started on this project, it had been a while since I did a multilingual build. And at the time, there wasn't as much information as there is now. So I thought, well, I'll just do a step-by-step -step walkthrough of everything. Hopefully save you a lot of time so you don't have to go through all the hassle that I went through when I was trying to figure this out. Uh, the great news about this is that <clears throat> You can do all of this without any coding knowledge required. And it's still a lot to take in, but you can be a site builder. We're not gonna have any sort of code snippet kind of thing, so it's just a lot of configuration and things that you've gotta figure out. All right, first let's talk about what modules we're going to need to configure a multilingual Drupal site. So first, what core modules are we going to need? You're pretty much going to need all of them uh, that are in core. So you got four main modules. You've got configuration translation. This allows you to configure things like blocks, menus, content translation. Lets you translate nodes, taxonomy terms, other entities, interface translation. We'll talk through this later. Lets you translate all the hard-coded text that you have around the site. And then the language module allows you to manage languages. Wait, no contrib? What's going on? So, like, we don't have all these contrib de dependencies in Drupal 8. It's, it's in core. It's awesome. I mean, most of you, I think, that have experience, you know how painful it is, like all the contrib stuff you have to deal with. Um, we didn't need contrib hardly anything for Visit USA except for the um, the modules that connect with our translation partner, and that's optional, right? If uh, that's only if you're using a translation partner. <coughs> so everything else was straight up core. That's the way we like to do it in Drupal 8. I love it. All right. Now let's t talk about setting up languages. We're going to reference this as our kind of home base. So if you go to admin slash configure, right, you see all of your configuration. The stuff we're going to be talking about today is in the regional and language area of that page. So we'll see this screenshot multiple times. This is where you're going to start out. Click on languages. By default, you would just see English enabled if that's your install, you know, your default language, which I think it's going to be typical. Um, you can add languages. Many of the languages from uh, many of the languages include language packs that um, have interface translations for various core and contributed uh, contributed modules. That's great if that's important to you, but 
my experience, most people administering the Drupal site or the translations are English speakers or no English or whatever, and so that's the whole language pack stuff is less of an issue really. Um, but uh, so it's not it's not a big deal. So where that comes into play is. Once you're adding language, you've got that big drop-down list. At the bottom of the list, you can add custom languages. A custom language is just a name and a, the, the language prefix, right? So the English prefix is en, you know, uh, French is fr, all that kind of stuff. Well, for us, you know, this, the custom language thing was really useful. We didn't need the language pack stuff for interface. That, that wasn't relevant for us. But being able to uh, preserve those the language prefixes they were using on the old site that we were migrating for was very useful for us. I mean, we could have changed them up, but it would have been just really, really confusing, right? Um, so uh, that was really useful for me. Uh, and, and it could be useful for you if you want to preserve whatever language prefixes you're using uh, prior. The custom ones, do you have like a library or something? No. I mean, it's just, it's like, it's just a name and a prefix. It's really all it is. And then that's what it does? It just... <laughs> it just adds it. It's there. I mean, it, it's pretty arbitrary, to be honest. It's kind of um, like a key that you use to yeah. uh, tell it, this is the language I want to remember. It. You select like that locale. Yeah, it's, okay. like a, it's like a key, kind of. So they're making like a Star Trek website? Quite Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck getting a third party to support that, though. <laughs> Well, you're translating it. I mean, somebody's having to translate all that. So you oh, okay. Just, okay. Hey, okay. Yeah. I, that's what I was... If you want to just make up your own language or whatever, yeah. I mean, you could... Language testing is all. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good point. Um, all right, so let's talk about translating your content. First question for the audience. Oh, is Drupal 8, is content translated by the field or the, you know, entity? Which is it? By the field. If you guess field, you are right. So what does that mean? <clears throat> it means for every translation, you've got the same entity ID, no matter what, that's useful. It wasn't always this way. Older versions of Drupal, you might have different IDs and it's real confusing, but Drupal 8, you're translating all the fields on all your content. So that's an important distinction. All right. Okay, so the very first thing you're going to need to do once you're trying to enable translation for your content, you might start with your content types. So you would go to the edit page for your content type, and all you've got to do is in the little language settings area is click a couple check boxes, they show language selector on create and edit pages, enable translation, and then boom, it's enabled. Um, you'll start seeing that little language selector that, uh, on, that I'm shown there on the left. Obviously, there's more stuff that you're gonna have to do other than just that. So once you enable that, you're gonna see uh, a translate tab on, uh, on your content. And it's gonna show you all of your content. It's gonna give you edit links by your content. If you haven't added a translation yet, then you'll have uh, an add button. So that's all well and good, but it's not really going to do anything until we translate our fields. So in this case, just a simple example, I edited the description field on one of my content types and I, all I had to do is click one checkbox that says users may translate this field. Once you do that, you can translate it. So now I can add Japanese in whatever language I want. Now, anonymous users? what's that? Anonymous users, or just any, like, you have to be logged in to translate it? Users may translate it? <coughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're going to have to have editing permissions for sure to translate it. Okay. Yeah. Now, another way to look at all of your content configuration at a bird's eye view is to go to the content, language, and translation page. So, from the same area, regional language area, the configuration admin page. This is going to show, show you all of your entity configuration, um, all of your fields and content types, everything that is configured will show up here. And you might find it faster to use this interface as opposed to you know going around and clicking edit by every single field and all your different content types and taxonomy terms and all that. 
So this is a useful screen. Alrighty, that was fun. Any questions so far? We're gonna cover a lot more stuff, but any questions on that so far? Anything confusing you? Okay, question. Sorry, so I've never done any, I do all like federal stuff, so I never sure. do any translation. If you do a, a custom one, you, you have to make sure that you don't pick a, a abbreviation that's already used, right? <clears throat> Regarding the um, cus uh, custom languages? Yeah. Well, so if you're starting with English, then the only one that the only prefix that's taken is en, and then okay, after that. So but if you added, yeah, if you added uh, a French language and you're using like a thing from the drop down, but then you want to add French Canadian and use a different prefix, then you would just need to make sure that yeah, it's not the same all, prefix. So it'll probably give you an error. The ones that you're using are unique. Right. Yeah. You'll. The, they of course will need to be unique because that's the key for that language. Well, that, but I mean unique overall. Like I create, if I create a custom language, do I have to make a unique key for it out of a whole list or just the ones that I have made? I mean, it's completely arbitrary. The key it can just be whatever. Okay. It's just a, it's just it's like a machine name almost. You know, it's just a key okay. for that language. Yep. Let's talk quickly about what fields should even be allow, uh, be allowed to be translated. So there's a little bit of strategy here. Now first, let's talk paragraphs. The paragraphs module was used a bunch on Visit USA. It's a pretty popular module. The big thing you might you will need to know uh, about paragraphs if you're using it is that not that you can't translate the paragraph field. It's a kind of a nuanced thing, but. You can't translate paragraphs, but you can still translate all the fields on the paragraph. So you're pretty much okay. Um, they'll give you warnings all over the place, like don't, you know, this isn't supported or whatever, but they don't prevent you from clicking the checkbox. Um, so if you did click that check, uh, checkbox, uh, probably you'd have some really weird stuff happening. So I recommend not doing that. All right, let's talk through in, uh, another few examples. Taxonomy. Now, initially on Visit USA, we made just about everything translatable. We wanted like maximum flexibility, or at least that's what was communicated to us, is like editors want to translate everything. Okay, so we even made our taxonomy fields and image fields and all this stuff, we made it translatable, but <clears throat> that's not really the recommended approach. We ended up backing that out and making more of them shared um, when you just think about it, with when you're tagging a page with various terms, you know, taxonomy terms, I mean, it really should stay the same for each translation. You don't have to worry. You can have the term name and other fields on those terms translated. That's not a problem. So it, it's going to automatically, you only have to relate it once, right? You can relate the English term. It's got, it's got the ID association. It's going to render the French term on the French page as long as you've translated that name. No problem, right? Um, are you going to have different terms for French than English than whatever? I mean, it's going to vary per use case, but I find that it's easier and more straightforward to not translate your taxonomy fields. That's my advice, but it will vary. So, just a quick question yep. on that. Like, um, I, it looked like it was an entity reference. I think what you were saying, I understood all the <coughs> Yeah, sorry, the taxonomy field. So the field where you're relating the taxonomy term back to your content type in this case. You can translate that field, which means that the French note page can have a different taxonomy term. I mean, you're free to do that. We thought, okay, editors want complete flexibility. That's what they communicated to us. Let's just make everything translatable. But then, you know, after the fact, they're like, no, we don't really want that. <laughs> Because like when you associate, so in this case you're associating like a state with a city, like it's going to be the same, you know, for okay. us uh, across languages. Yeah. If I understand correctly, would that apply also like the same tip to any entity reference? Like if I have a relationship between, you know, courses in a in a, in a university and teachers, like the same courses I are taught by the same right. teachers, so I don't I don't. Translate the reference field to the other note, right? Yeah. Is that what you're suggesting? Exactly. So, in uh, 
related fields was my other example. It's basically the same thing as a taxonomy term. And so I definitely recommend the same approach of not translating those fields unless, of course, you do have a use case where you want that content to vary. Um, if it's like, if they tell you, the client tells you, well, maybe every once in a while we might want to change it. I don't feel like that's a good enough reason to make a translate because it's a lot more burden on editors and things to have to manage all these different relationships across all of your languages. We've got like 15 languages or something on VizUSA. So for related fields, for taxonomy fields, I would start with it's shared until you just have a really good reason to not make it shared. That's my advice on that. <clears throat> All right, images. Now, images are also big. You should know that if you translate an image by default, it will not translate the file, the image file. There is a checkbox at the bottom, and I didn't catch it at first when I was messing around with it. I didn't know by default it didn't need the file. It does the alt text and the title text makes that translatable if you turn on translation, which makes sense, right? You want the alt text for the French page to be in French, you know, et cetera. But you might not want the file to be re-uploaded every single time. Now again, just like everything else, it could vary per your use case. But what we found is that editors didn't want to manage all the different images. It's just gonna, it's going to vary. For example, a lot of times on the home page, they might want to localize that image. So they want to speak to uh, this particular audience from this particular, you know, country, language or whatever. Okay. Make it translatable, make the file translatable there. But for lots of other use cases, it's a lot of hassle to manage a bunch of different file references, etc., across all these uh, languages. So, so, like the file name or the, the, the file? file itself? The file association, yeah, the file. Oh. So, um, again, I'm recommending that you don't translate it unless <laughs> you, it's proven that, yes, it's going to vary a lot per language. So, let's go ahead and translate that file. Um, certainly translating the alt text and title text makes sense as like a good default. But it, isn't it kind of hard to change it after the fact? Like once you have data in the field? It would That's be... a good question. Is it hard to change it after the fact? It actually isn't. You, it's just like a checkbox. Now my theory, I haven't dug into it super deeply. My theory is that the data is still kind of hanging around. Um, but it's actually not that bad. We've gone back where we had some taxonomy terms and things that were translatable, but then um, we turned it off and it like just works okay. I think it just like ignores that data. I don't think it purges it. Like I think we could toggle it back, back on or whatever. I think it just like ignores all the non-English ones or whatever. So it's actually pretty nice. So you're not completely backed into a corner if you change your mind on which fields should be translated. That's something to consider. I'm really happy about that. Okay, we talked about that one. Let's. Actually, oh. Sorry, on your last slide, yep. you didn't actually have the title field enabled, but you have the translatable. It, um, um, it's grayed out. That means um, if you if you translate the file, you have to translate the alt in the title. I see. Okay, thank you. So. Okay. In the case of if that was not images, if that was like PDF. If I'm I mean, jumping same kind of deal. Right, but you might want to have it serve up. Spanish version. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Like that would be a better use case for making it, make it translatable. Uh, translatable. Absolutely. I would, I would think, yeah, for, for documents and things like that, lots of text, right? You'd probably want that translatable. Yeah, it'll vary. Let's talk about the translation interface. So going back to our admin uh, configuration page. User interface translation is the link you'll want. If you haven't used this before, I mean, they have basically the same kind of thing in previous versions of Drupal, but it's like a find and replace kind of action. So think about your site. You've got button text all over the place. You might have just random hard-coded strings, you know. Click, click here, view more here, whatever, like stuff that's hard-coded. This is where you're going to need to go to translate all that stuff. So as long as you're using the Drupal translation function, whether it's in a template, I've got a little screen grab where I'm showing a code snippet from a template. It's got the, in Twig, it's just called like T that you append uh, your string with. As long as it's got that, 
or in code, it's got the T function, it's going to register and show up on this page. If you don't have that, it's not gonna show up on this page and you're not gonna be able to translate it and people are gonna be confused. So assuming that your source language, your default language is English, you're gonna be searching for all your strings in English. Um, and what we did, I don't have screenshots for this, but what we did is we exported all of these to human readable files and passed them along to the translation partner. They translated them, we imported them back. We're not gonna go over that in this presentation, but it's not so bad. Um, so that's an option for doing bulk updates. And so once we did that, then as we added new uh, strings of text, we would just use this interface for managing those. So that's pretty easy. Any questions on this part? How do you export? How do you export? Yeah. I mean, it's just like a button push. Or something? Do what? Use a view or something? There's tabs there. Import. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, there's an import uh, and export yeah. tab. Sorry. sorry. And so it's just a button. Uh, it's got a couple of options on it. I thought it was a little bit out of scope for this presentation, but I mean, it's not that bad. What's the default format wherever you export? Is it a PO file? Yeah, it's like a it's a PO file. Okay. Um, there's it's a look there's confusing there's like the source file is like pot dot pot I think yeah, and then P -P. each each translation so a French one would be dot PO yeah. and it's like key value pairs and so the key is the uh, English string and then the the value is your translated string yeah. In Drupal eight is that can that be done by so that it's actually reading it from the file so. If Configuration management kind of thing. So it's your translations are actually in code. It's similar to configuration management, but it's it's not configuration like other things like YAML files. So you import it with the import tab, and so it'll import those like you're importing configuration. It's just a little bit different. Okay. Let's see how we're doing on time. I usually run through my slides so fast. Okay. Menus. So remember the, the page where we went, where we, sorry, where we were earlier, where we saw all of our content configuration, we saw content types, bird's eye view, you're able to click all the different fields you want. So one of the things that you'll see there is custom menu links. And usually you're gonna want to translate your menu links, right? And so you'll check some of that stuff off. As soon as you do, when you add menu items through the Drupal menu interface, you're gonna have a translate tab. And just like we've seen before, you click on the translate tab, you can translate the name, the links, whatever, and you're good. Does that sound easy enough? And does that make a different link, or? I'm gonna to have to remember. I feel like, can, can't you change the link if you want? We could look at it later. I've got it pulled up later. I don't remember, okay. to be honest. <laughs> so would it just like automatically go to that page's translation of the node ID? Right, it's gonna know which menu link it's to pull up. It's gonna say the ID. Okay. Yeah, it's the same, the, 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 the menu yeah. item is like an entity, I think, so it'll have the same ID. So it's points. Huh. So it's I mean, it's all similar. But yeah, that's how you that's how you do menu translation. Like once you get the hang of it, so we're gonna look at taxonomy. Once you get the hang of it, like a lot of it's similar, right? Because these are entities, interfaces are similar. So same kind of deal. You go to the content screen, you enable translation on your various taxonomy vocabularies. And then you, then you go and add some taxonomy terms. Now you've got that translate tab. And you can translate the name of it, description, any fields you add, you can decide which ones you want translatable. You know, in Drupal 8, of course, you can add fields to like everything, so any of that can be translatable. So yeah, this is fun and easy, right? So. Yep, question? I guess I, I get confused a little bit between translation and localization, like you said, <coughs> entity references. Like if, if the URL, no, I'm trying to think of an example. Like the 
they want something different in this particular language than they did in the original. Maybe they want a different entity. Right, and that's more localization. It's like where you're not strictly just translating it from language to language. You're localizing it. You're wanting it to be different. It's not just translated. Is that kind of bundled in this? Yeah, I'm kind of using this interchangeably, but I mean, you can localize it. So we'll have the same language for multiple geos. We'll have British English. We'll have you know regular English. We'll have Whatever American English, is. it's regular to me. American yeah. Americanese. Americanese. So we got multiple, multiple locales for languages, and a lot of times they want different content for French, uh, for the French Canadian site than the You're France, French. yeah, <laughs> French site. So French that's localization, right? It's the same language. They're not translating it. It's it's localized. I mean, I'm kind of. But you can kind I think. Of use Things give you the opportunity to right. I mean, you're still doing. I mean, I'm using them kind of interchangeably, but you're either translating it or localizing it. I mean, it's the same. It's the same operation. All right. Let's talk about how to configure language negotiation. So we're heading back to the languages screen we were at earlier, where you added your languages. So you added Spanish, French, etc. We didn't talk about the detection and selection tab. So you're going to want to click on that to decide, uh, so Drupal knows how to decide which language to render. Okay, so you'll have a bunch of options. Now I am not an expert on all of these. What's very typical, I think it might even be the default thing, is the URL language detection. So the description for that says, language from the URL, path prefix, or domain. And so we're going to talk through these two options. The other options you can investigate. This is going to be the more typical option. Now, the two options are unfortunately mutually exclusive. So you have to pick, if you're doing URL negotiation, you have to pick between the domain or you can use uh, path prefixes. So the, the prefix option that you see on the left is the easier option. It's also my preferred option. So this is where you simply have a prefix that tells the URL which language to render. All of your links are gonna add this prefix automatically. Uh, it's pretty easy. Um, and I think this is the default. If you've been to many multilingual sites, a lot of them use language prefixes, so it should be familiar to you. Now the second option is what we did on Visit USA. <laughs> and so Visit USA, as many sites like to do, they like to do their own domains for each language. Now some, some sites will do subdomains, which is a little bit easier because you can share sessions across subdomains, but top level domains you can't share sessions for, so every time they need to edit a French translation, they've got to make sure they're still logged into the French site. There's not like a real easy way around that, um, so it's a little bit more hassle. The URLs look a little bit nicer. It's nice that you, you can't kind of accidentally escape from the language when you're on that uh, domain. Um, Maybe it helps for SEO, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure, but you know, they've managed these domains for a while. They wanted to keep their domains, it made sense, but it uh, does add some work. So unless you have a great reason for doing that, I would still recommend the prefix, um, the prefix setting. Now, for our local environments, we actually overrode this option so that locally we could do the path prefix and that worked okay. It was like just a settings.php override. It's a little bit out of scope for this, but we did do that for our local environment. The downside is for testing, you won't catch everything with that. So <laughs> we've been talking about maybe we need to do like fake you know, domains locally in our vagrant. So, but yeah, I still recommend prefix if you can get away with it. Let's talk about a few gotchas. A few things to consider. Uh, first thing, views. It's not really a gotcha, just a reminder that if you're creating views, we didn't do much views on Visit USA, but if you're using views, you've got to remember to add that content 
uh, translation language filter. Otherwise, you're, con- you're going to be showing the wrong content and people are going to be mad at you. <laughs> That's a friendly reminder, the, like a public service annou- announcement. Okay, now this one is a good one, translation interface. Now, this one confused me for a little bit because I hadn't done multilingual in a while. But you have to you have to remember how um, all your text shows up here. That your text for all of your hard coded strings do not show up here until a page with that string has been loaded somewhere. It's not aware of it. It hasn't been like compiled or whatever, right? So this is important because, like on Visit USA, I wanted to export every hard coded string. We have a million buttons all over the place say view more or whatever, um, a lot of those little strings, labels and things, right, that just, it doesn't make sense for it to be anywhere but a hard-coded string in a template file somewhere, fine, I want to export all that, but not everything was showing up here, I'm like, where is it? Well, I had to go around and make sure for every type of page that we had, which was a bunch, um, probably it could have been a couple dozen, I don't know if it was that much, but something like that to make sure I hit every single one of those pages before I exported all of my strings. Um, once I did that, they're all in the export file, got that sent over to the translation partner, and we're all good. So um, that's the thing that will make you a little bit crazy. It made me a little bit crazy when I was looking at it because I kind of forgot about that. There, Does that part make sense? Yeah. Is there another way to do that? Like running the website or some other way? So the question is, is there an automatic way to do that? I don't, I'm not aware of it. I mean... You troll your site map. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you could you could create something, but to my knowledge, there isn't like some automatic way to you know, to be aware of it. Try using one of those link checker tools. Yes. Yeah. Just visits everything. Now, so this was a, an issue for us because we were using an install profile to rebuild the site from scratch, uh, which is... Separate topic, but useful. Like, so we liked using install profile. That means all this stuff wasn't cached. If you're not doing that, then and you're working on the site, probably it's not going to be an issue for you because you've hit every page. But we we're rebuilding the site from scratch whenever we worked on it, right? You, we get the latest code, rebuild it from scratch. You know, so that's why I had to manually go through every single page once I wanted to get it exported. Okay. Uh, Path Auto. The good thing is we had this one problem with Path Auto that was just a bug that's been fixed. But uh, just something to know about Path Auto. Um, it will. It's smart enough to know to if you've got the node title as part of your um, alias, your automatic alias settings. It's going to know to automatically translate that. So the French title will be lowercase. You know, cleaned up. A version of that French title or whatever. Um, the one quirk with that is that for some of these languages that don't have the kind of normal ASCII set that we're used to, Japanese, Chinese, they've got different characters, um, they're going to look kind of weird. Uh, they will be um, transliterated if you check the box that says transliterate, you know, whatever, it's going to transliterate. I just, I don't know how well it does it. <laughs> I mean, it works, it just kind of looks a little strange. I feel like Several of the languages have that issue. So what was your experience with your customers that have? Well, I think they're okay with it. I, I don't, you know, I can't read Japanese, so I don't know how well it's tra- transliterating the thing. To me, it looks like a bunch of random characters. I'm like, I doubt this is a good representation of the original language. Um, I know a little bit of pinyin uh, in Chinese because I lived in China for a little while, but I still. Uh, but we don't. Uh, we don't manage the Chinese site. It's a separate site, so I wasn't able to f- fact check <laughs> how well they're doing their uh, translation. So does it not support double byte characters in the URL? Does, uh, what's the question again? Does it not support the double byte characters? Then? Right. Like I don't think so. I think it's gonna. It's gonna require the transliteration. It's not going to let you put slash, you know, Japanese characters. Um, oh. It's not going to let you do that. I don't even know if that's supported. I don't know enough about special character sets. Um, it's messy. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, I just don't know enough about it. But um, I was, and they seem satisfied with, you know, the solution that we came up with. I mean, the URL, when you think about it, it's kind of arbitrary. Um, 
it's well, debatable how useful it is. It impacts SEO. Uh, SEO, right? It does it impact SEO. Yeah. Area. So that's that's a quirk. So that's why I wanted to raise that. <clears throat> uh, did I cover everything? Okay, good. All right. So this is the last section of our little tutorial here. Uh, let's talk a minute about uh, TMSs, trans translation management system. Lingotech is well known in the Drupal community, uh, but there's a bunch of other providers. I'll be covering a couple just as, as examples. Not everybody uses a translation partner, but you might, or you might be interested to know just how it works, right? Now on visit, we used a, a big company called SDL, and they they are leveraging a popular contributed module called the Translation Management Tool, and it's a really nice tool. And so for the vendor, SCL, they're not having to write all this stuff from scratch. They're managing a connector module that connects all their stuff, the Drupal stuff, but for the site builder or developer, what's nice about it is that a lot of these providers use the same tool, and so it's like a consistent interface. So we had I watched a presentation from a coworker who used a different translation partner, but they're using a similar connector module, and I understood everything he was showing me because I'm like, this is the same interface. It made sense to me. So, um, yeah, I think that's a really cool thing. Um, a couple quick screen grabs. It's a little bit hard to see. I'm not going to go real in depth into this, but <clears throat> what's very common is that. When you're looking at your translations, you've got um, this little action called request the translation. Translations go into a cart, and then you check out, get sent over. Sometimes they'll give you like cost estimates and things. Um, it gets sent off, it comes back. You have reporting, you have statuses, you have lots of good stuff in there. You can review it side by side. You can accept and download, retrieve the translation. There's all these different things you can do. It's really robust. Um, it's nice. So if you're using any of the providers that leverage the translation management tool, then you're going to have this interface. Now, what's kind of interesting is that <clears throat> Lingotech doesn't use this tool. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure what the reasoning is. Um, they <coughs> It might be because in previous versions that tool didn't exist and so they had to make their own and they just upgraded, I'm not sure. But their stuff's, their module's still really good. So Lingotech is very popular. Just a couple quick screen grabs here. They've got a dashboard, still kind of similar workflow of adding stuff to carts, checking out, checking the status of stuff, retrieving your translations, et cetera, et cetera. That's kind of the general workflow. And um, we like Lingotech because they'll, they'll let you uh, create a developer account and just turn on machine translation. Just like if you're demoing for a client, like, hey, this is what we can do for you, and here's you know an example. So we have an internal demo site that we'll do for uh, prospects and things, and we'll just demonstrate the Lingotech thing because you send it off to Lingotech, they're just doing a machine translation comes back, see, look, it worked, you know, that kind of thing. So it's like, helps educate people on what the process looks like. So that's really helpful. I like that they do that. All right, and so we're done with that portion. This is, you know, 90% or so what we had to do as far as all the multilingual configuration. I mean, we did a lot of coding and stuff, but, you know, not really directly related to configuring multilingual, so. I hope this is helpful for you. Uh, I wish I had had a presentation that showed me everything before I started. I kind of had to learn as we went. But uh, yeah, so we'll open it up for questions. Yeah. Question. question. Um, what's the difference between Lingotech and SDL? I have several of those questions for Lingotech. They seem pretty well. Um, but SDL, I never heard of it. When you went with SDL, what was the reason? That's a great question. So just to repeat the question, you know, what's the benefits? Obviously, SDL is a different company than Lingotech. What, what are some of the differences? Um, the reason why we went with SDL was that they already had a pre-existing relationship with the client and they wanted to stick with them. That made sense. They had a couple of Drupal 7 sites that we migrated. Uh, so they were familiar with the workflow, the, the, that vendor relationship. So it made sense for them to stay with that in Drupal 8. Uh, SDL had a Drupal 8 module, so that wasn't an issue. 
uh, we've worked with them as um, as the module might need a patch or things like that. Um, they're fine. As far as um, you know, we like Lingotech a lot. Media Current's a partner with Lingotech. That's usually who we recommend, you know, right off the bat, just because we've got a good relationship with them and we know how involved they are in a Drupal community. Definitely, with if you're researching TMSs, uh, the first thing you're going to look at is do they have a Drupal module? Because you do not want to manage your own Drupal module. And the ones that do have a Drupal module, you're going to want it to make sure it's a good module. Like with Lingotech, you know, I've got a lot of confidence in their uh, Drupal module. Now that I've worked with SDL, I've got confidence in theirs. I don't know a lot about some of the other providers out there, but for me as a developer, if I'm you know, selling them all this stuff, it's less risk on our end if we know that we've got a trusted partner. If, if their module has a lot of problems or some translation partner doesn't really have a module and they're like, well, you can build it, like that's a lot of risk. So that's where I start is how well supported is whatever Drupal connector module they're using. So, um, but yeah, I mean, they're both great. I don't know all the ins and outs of, you know, pricing and all that other stuff. I have no idea. But, you know, from my perspective, which is like the developer, it's like, okay, these work fine. I'm good. Okay, question? The, the machine documentation from Lingotech, like, do, do they do like the content translation so you can demonstrate that, like, the multilingual feature of the site? That's why you, you use them for? So the question is um, about uh, Lingotech's machine translation. So, yeah, they can translate content, so it's not a human looking at it. It's just you're, you're passing it along to an API, you know, behind the scenes, and it's going through their translation, their machine stuff, it's coming back. Now, if you're actually, if you hired Lingotech, they can do a combination of machine language translation and human translation to save costs, all this kind of stuff. They give you like a million options. It's really amazing what translation partners can do, and all the interfaces they have, all that. But so just for the sake of demonstrating to a client who may have no idea what you know, a translation partner is, or maybe you're trying to sell them on Drupal, and like, here's how easy Drupal is with translation. Look, I just send it off, and like, two seconds later, here's, you know, here's just, you know, an example. So it's really good for that. Okay, cool. Uh, other questions? All right, cool. Thank y'all. And if uh, you can hit me up afterwards if you got anything else, but uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank y'all.